Uh, so yeah, so I'm excited to tell everybody today about what excites me, which is watching chemistry evolve across cosmic time. Uh, so I'll start, uh, as did many others, with a, an overview of my journey so far. Uh, and my journey with chemistry actually starts from the age of one week. Uh, so this is a, a picture of me and, and my father. My dad is a, a professor of chemistry at Eastern Illinois University, giving me my very first periodic table. Uh, and that continued all the way through for many years. Uh, started a bachelor program in chemistry at the University of Illinois. Uh, there I worked with a professor by the name of Ben McCall doing high resolution molecular spectroscopy. Uh, and one of the major conferences in this field each year is the International Symposium on Molecular Spectroscopy. It's a great experience. I recommend it to everybody. But one of the beautiful things about ISMS is that it brings together spectroscopists in a wide variety of fields. And it's here that I got introduced to using spectroscopy for astronomical observations. And so throughout the course of my graduate career, I, I started and did a master's at Emory University with Susanna Whittakus Weaver and then finished with a PhD at Caltech with Jeff Blake. Uh, I still did some, some high resolution molecular spectroscopy in the lab, the, the laser there and, and my lab mates are what I did my thesis work on. But I actually spent many months doing spectroscopy with radio telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea, high in the Inyo Mountains in California and in Green Bank, West Virginia, uh, learning how we can use spectroscopic probes to understand our molecular universe. And for the last six years, I've been a postdoctoral fellow at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. My mentor is there, Tony Remigen, and then up at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, uh, Mike McCarthy, give me some really wonderful opportunities to uh, expand my horizons. I've learned how to be a, a panelist doing outreach at sci-fi and fantasy conventions, uh, moved from working with lasers to working with microwaves, started some uh, interestingly named international collaborations and, and even learned how to give a few press conferences, which was exciting. Uh, and I have just started at MIT, so no pictures there yet, but hopefully some, some interesting things to come. So you can see my journey started with chemistry and then picked up astronomy partway through my graduate career there and leads me to where I am now, which is an astrochemist. So what is astrochemistry? Well, to me, it's the study of molecules in space, where they are, how they got there, and what they're doing. Uh, and chemistry has its own journey through cosmic time. Uh, it starts all the way back at the Big Bang, where we make hydrogen and helium and then a smattering of heavier elements and not much else. And it's not until that hydrogen and helium is condensed down into the first stars and those stars synthesize carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and die ejecting those heavy elements into the interstellar medium that we can actually start doing real organic chemistry in the dark clouds of gas and dust where the next generation of stars will be born. Of course, when those stars are born, they inject more energy into the system. They give us the, the energetic fuel to drive chemistry forward. We know now that around most of those stars, planets will form, and those planets are constantly bombarded with the chemical remnants of the early solar systems and natal molecular clouds from which they're formed as comets and meteorites crash down to the surfaces. Now, in at least one example, we know that life will arise, uh, but no matter what, that life will eventually be destroyed in some sort of fiery cataclysm that resets all of that chemistry back into this cosmic chemical life cycle. Now, chemistry is occurring at every single step along this process. And we've heard today all of our speakers talking about the wonderful things they're doing with chemistry in the small area of life where we are right now. I'm interested in how we got to this point. How do you make a cat from hydrogen and helium? Uh, how do you trace the chemical steps from the Big Bang to where we are today? So I do that by looking for molecules. I'm a molecule hunter. I try to probe the chemical inventories in each of these different locations along this path of chemical evolution. So how do we go hunting for molecules in space? Well, I do it, and I think the best way to do it is using rotational spectroscopy, the patterns of light that molecules give off uh, or absorb as they tumble end over end in space. And it turns out it's a pretty good way to do it. More, almost 90% of all molecules that we see in space are detected with rotational spectra. And there's a few different reasons for that, but the perhaps the simplest explanation is just that it takes a lot less energy to rotate a molecule than it does to vibrate a bond or move an electron. And space is cold, energy is at a premium. And so if we want to uh, probe molecules in the widest array of places, we want the lowest energy process possible, and that's rotational spectroscopy. So what does this actually look like if we want to detect a molecule? 
Well, here's an actual spectrum of an interstellar cloud that I took using a radio telescope down around 20 gigahertz. You see a pattern of lines here coming from molecules tumbling end over end in space. And if we want to identify this molecule, all we do is take a spectrum of a molecule here on Earth, get its unique rotational fingerprint, and then match it up with the spectra that we see in interstellar clouds. And there's no other molecule other than CH2CN here in the universe that could give this exact set of frequencies in this exact set of intensity patterns. And in fact, from the absolute and in relative intensities, we can learn something about how much of the molecule there, how warm is it. Now, it's not always this easy or I wouldn't have a job, but this actually is how you do molecular identifications in space. It's matching the spectra on Earth to the spectra that we see from the stars. So what kind of questions can we answer? What kind of questions am I interested in answering uh, using our ability to detect molecules? Well, I'm going to give you three big questions that I'm interested in. And the first is, how does carbon move through our universe? Right, carbon is fundamental to life. It's fundamental to many of the molecules that we heard uh, discussed today. How does it uh, get formed? How does it progress from those first generation of stars through the formation of stars, planets, and solar systems? Secondly, how much interstellar chemistry finds its way to planets in the end, right? We have these giant molecular clouds that are doing organic chemistry, but when we turn on a star, does it all get blown up? When we form a planet, does it all get irradiated and eradicated? Uh, or does some of that uh, chemical complexity uh, find its way to seed planets? And finally, why are all our amino acids left-handed, right? What's the origin of biological homochirality? And is that actually potentially coming from space? And we can try to answer all three of these questions using detections of molecules in space. We can look for large carbon-containing molecules and try to understand how they move through the universe. We can make maps of complex organic molecules and see where they are in relation to stars and planets as they're forming. Uh, and we can hunt for chiral molecules in the interstellar medium and try to uh, search out whether or not they could actually uh, imbue us with an enantiomeric excess. So I'll give you one slide on each of these three questions here before I wrap up. So the first one, where is the carbon? Well, it turns out we actually know the answer to this. Uh, we think, uh, as far as we can tell, about 10 to 25 percent of all carbon in the universe is locked up in aromatic rings, uh, molecules that look like this, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And we know this because these are one of the, the few sets of molecules that radiates brightly in the infrared. Uh, they fluoresce on the uh, characteristic CC and CH bending and stretching modes of aromatic molecules. And we see them all over in our galaxy and in external galaxies. But there's such a complicated soup of molecules uh, that even the fingerprint regions that we're used to from organic chemistry labs are too conf convoluted for us to identify any individual PAH molecule. That means that it's really hard for us to study the detailed chemical uh, evolution of maybe a quarter of all carbon in the universe, and that's embarrassing. And it's doubly embarrassing because we actually understand how PAHs are made here on Earth pretty well, right? And that's because they're pollutants. They're the byproducts of incomplete fossil fuel combustion, and they're carcinogens. They're the, the black char marks on our meats and vegetables that we get from grills. Now, we know that they're made in high temperature, high energy environments on Earth. So we suppose that they're probably made in high temperature environments in space. So if you go look for these molecules, say, around dying carbon stars that are outputting carbon black soot into the interstellar medium, you find PAHs in these high energy environments. And that's been the, the consensus for the last 30 years or so. This is how you make them. But that actually might not be the whole story. Because it turns out a couple years ago, myself and my colleagues found them in cold, 10 Kelvin cold, starless clouds. Right? There's no high energy environment here. There's no circumstellar envelope of a shell uh, of a star. There's just carbon molecules participating in low temperature chemistry in a way that we don't see here on Earth. And we're just now starting to figure out whether or not this is going to play a role in our understanding of how aromatic carbon evolves through the process of forming stars. So we can also ask, where are the molecules as these stars and planets form? Well, we're uh, uh, able to make maps of these molecules using interferometers. So here's an actual map. In red is a map of HDO, so deuterated water, in uh, a young stellar system. Right at the center of this map is a young protostar. And what it's doing is it's ejecting these high-velocity, high-temperature outflows of HDO. As the star accretes mass, it has to shed angular momentum by 
spewing molecular material out along its two axes here. And that molecular material is injecting energy into the system. So we can ask the question, what happens when that high energy material impacts the surrounding cloud? What's the chemistry look like? So we can pick a pixel here right where that uh, outflow is impacting the background gas, and we can see the complex rotational spectrum that shows up. Right? We can detect dozens and dozens of complex organic molecules here that are being synthesized, liberated, and further reacting by the energy being injected into the system from this newborn star. Things like glycolaldehyde, methylformate, acetic acid, acetamid. Uh, these are very complex by interstellar standards. I understand they're, they're not so large by the standards of what we've seen today. Um, molecules can also help us peer into the hearts of stars. So here's a massive protostar called Orion Source I. Uh, and right down there in the center, there's another massive star there. And this blue ring that's traced out around it is actually the rotational emission of sodium chloride, table salt. And it's actually allowing us to trace, to peer in past all the gas and dust that's obscuring our view and see how this material is accreting and rotating around this star. And finally, why are our amino acids left-handed, right? We're, we all think back to Gen Chem, where we see the stereotypic chiral molecules and compare them to our two hands, right? Non-superimposable mirror images that have the same physical properties, the same melting, boiling, and freezing points, but interact differently with other chiral systems, right? So if you take the molecule carvone, right, the S and the R in antiomers here interact differently with the chiral taste and smell receptors in our body to produce uh, caraway flavoring or, or spearmint flavoring. Right? But there's no energetic reason to pick one or the other. So why did life choose to use only the left-handed enantiomer of amino acids? Right? Well, we can think of a couple different options. One is maybe it was random chance. The dungeon master rolled a natural one, and now we are all left-handed. Uh, that's all well and good. Uh, you can also think, well, maybe life started on chiral surfaces at these black smoker hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, and that influenced the, the distribution that we have. I think uh, what excites me the most is the possible cosmic origins of these. If you look at meteorites that are delivering amino acids and sugars to our planet every day, even right now, uh, many of these amino acids show an excess of left-handed enantiomers by as much as 10%. And if that was the case, back when life was starting, that could actually drive life to choose left-handed amino acids as its preference. The problem though, is if we wanna look further back, say in a source like Sagittarius B2N in the galactic center, one of the best places to look for uh, new prebiotic molecules, we'd never detected a chiral molecule in space. Right? And that makes it really hard to probe the possible origins of, of uh, homo chirality. So uh, my colleagues and I set out a couple years ago to use the two most powerful radio telescopes in the world to detect one of these, and we were successful. So we were able to detect propylene oxide, the first chiral molecule ever seen in space. Can't tell you if there's an enantiomeric excess yet. We have a few ideas on how we might be able to look into that, uh, but the technology isn't quite there yet. But this does give us a handle on actually where to look and what questions to ask next. Right, so if we go back to the big questions, right, we're using detections of large carbon molecules to understand what we know about how carbon moves through the universe and what we were wrong about, what assumptions we need to reconsider. Right, we're using maps of molecules, complex organic molecules, to see how the interaction of star formation and planet formation is driving chemistry forward. And we're trying to peer back in history and look at the origins of our amino acids. So with that, uh, I'll leave a, a word cloud here of all of my collaborators over the years, uh, my funding agencies and the institutions that have hosted me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you so much for that, Brett. That was a great talk. Um, I learned a ton. Um, I wanted to ask, we only have a minute, so I'll just ask really quickly. Obviously, you're starting your lab at MIT in a very strange environment. Um, I'm wondering if you could just talk a minute. I'm sure there's like a small subset of people out there who are going through this experience like you are and in and how you're trying to adapt uh, right now. Yeah, well, it's been really interesting. I, I actually even haven't moved up to Boston yet. I'm still working on the same coffee table I was working on uh, three months ago. Um, so, you know, I've just tried to, uh, shift to the focus of my work primarily to what I can do uh, using uh, and uh, analyzing data I already have from radio telescopes, uh, 
doing chemical calculations uh, going forward, uh, setting the stage for what we want to do in the laboratory, and then really taking the time to plan out uh, a specific uh, agenda for once I'm in the lab, what am I going to do first? What equipment am I going to buy? Uh, what experiments do I want to do? And how is that going to change in three months when everything is upended yet again? Um, so, you know, I think the, the end result here is that we have to roll with the punches and the making definitive plans even three months out is is uh, iffy at this point. But that's okay, it's a new challenge. All right, well, you're five minutes into a career marathon, so <laughs> we can't wait to see what happens when you get when you get into the lab uh, and, are, and are settled. So thank you so much for your talk today, Brett. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm.